I walked into our office in London. Yeah. And it's eight o'clock in the morning. I was just off the, the flight over and I walk into the elevator and a young man walks into the elevator with me. And he looks at me and he says, you're David Solomon. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, I love the fact that you DJ and I'm proud to work at Goldman Sachs. And I said, well, that's just great. Tell me I about yourself. That. It's nice to yeah. meet you. And I, I really believe, I mean, we would have said hello in the elevator. I try to say hello to everybody when I go in the elevator. But he approached me. If, if, if he didn't feel that human connection, he might have been a little bit more intimidating. One of the lessons I've learned in martial arts is that standing still is asking to be hit. If you stand still in business, your competition is going to catch up. I start each morning practicing martial arts because it brings me balance and focus. And I want to know how others stay motivated as well. So join me for conversations on business, innovation, and entrepreneurship. I'm Dan Schulman. Welcome to Never Stand Still. On today's episode of Never Stand Still, I'm joined by David Solomon, who has spent decades in finance and is now currently the president and COO of Goldman Sachs, one of Wall Street's largest financial institutions. David's been at Goldman for almost 20 years and has helped grow businesses, drive major cultural and technological change, and usher the bank into a new era. While some might consider him an unconventional leader in the industry, David is a multifaceted executive who is known for his leadership around diversity and improving the culture at the firm. He also strongly believes in pursuing his passions outside of work, which for him include a longtime love of music. So David, welcome to Never Stand Still. It's great Thanks. to have you. Always yeah. great to be with you. So, Usually, you're interviewing me. <laughs> well, at least recently. <laughs> yeah. Now, this time, I get to turn the tables on you and interview you. And um, so, um, what I'd like to uh, do um, in the time that we have um, is for the audience to get to know a little bit more about you, um, what your journey was to where you are today. Um, maybe help them to understand some of the you know, it's never a straight line up and to the right. That's for sure. We, we know that absolutely uh, very, very well. <laughs> but I thought maybe I'd start a little bit outside of your business career. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, you know, you have a lot of passions. I mean, you love food, you love wine, you love music. Um, you know, you're now famous uh, because of so many different articles as being a electronic DJ. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about how some of those passions um, have influenced you and maybe even started you on your career path? Sure. Well, first, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, it's always, such a always great. Always great to spend time with you. Um, I'm a doer and I'm curious yeah. <laughs> and I'm interested in a lot of things. And, you know, you mentioned a, a handful of the things that I'm passionate about and I'm, 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 I'm interested in. But I guess I've, I've evolved to a perspective that you, you go through life and, you know, for all of us, I think obviously our, our, our families, you know, is where everything starts. Yep. But very quickly, if you're ambitious and you're working hard and you're trying to accomplish a lot and you're trying to be productive and have an impact professionally, you know, you get very sucked into what you're doing professionally. And I think, yeah. As you, as, you, as you go through that and you step back, and I've now you know, been at it 34, you know, 34, going on 35 years, you start it's to amazing, recognize it's, it? it's amazing <laughs> because I feel really young, <laughs> yeah. really energized. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's amazing because you, you know, it's not a straight line, but it's a marathon. Yeah. And you know, there are ups and downs and you've got to stay fresh and you've got to stay energized. And just for me personally, if I didn't have, if, if all I did was kind of focus on my family, focus on work, and I didn't have these other things that stimulated my mind, stimulated my emotions, yeah. helped me learn, grow, connect with other people. You yeah. know, one of the great things about passions and hobbies and interests is you wind up doing them or meeting people, you know, through those endeavors, yeah. and that enriches your life. 
And so, you know, I've, I've found that I just keep adding things. I'm very good at adding things. Right. I'm very bad at <laughs> dropping them right. and, um, you, know, you know, moving them out. And so I just try to keep expanding, you know, the purview of things um, and, and, and doing more and more. And it's for me personally, it's made my life, you know, richer. And I think also as a leader, you know, I'm starting to see the more I have an ability to share some of that yeah. with people around me, the more it makes me just a bit more human. Yeah. I also think it gives permission to the people who work with you to do more than just work as it, well. It, absolutely. I think it gives them permission to do more than just work. And I think it also gives them permission to approach you and connect with you in a way that's outside the framework of, of, of work. And so I was just, you know, I was discussing with some people last week. I walked into our office in London. Yeah. And it's eight o'clock in the morning. I was just off the, the flight over and I walk into the elevator and a young man walks into the elevator with me and he looks at me and he says, you're David Solomon. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, I love the fact that you DJ and I'm proud to work at Goldman Sachs. And I said, well, that's just great. Tell me I about yourself. That. It's nice to yeah. meet you. And I, I really believe, I mean, we would have said hello in the elevator. I try to say hello to everybody when I go in the elevator, but he approached me. If, if, if he didn't feel that human connection, he might have been a little bit more intimidated. He might have, but you know, might have been a little bit more put off. And so, that that to me was just an anecdote of how if people feel they can approach you on a different basis than hey, you're the boss. Yeah, it's um, it, it kind of opens you up. I think that's a great point. I would say probably maybe over half the conversations I have with PayPal employees mm -hmm. are about martial arts. It's awesome. Yeah, because it's just an interesting aspect of our lives and they want to know about it and they can relate to it. But when you start talking about work, then all of a sudden, you know, it can get laden with, you know, okay, you're the boss and, you know, and, Absolutely. and be yeah. difficult. You know, one of the things about uh, martial arts for me um, is that there's kind of a philosophy around it. And I sort of incorporate that into, you know, my philosophy around business mm -hmm. um, as well. You know, one of the big sayings that my trainer always says to me is the best way to win a fight is not to get into a fight, you know, and, and so I've actually... By the way, that applies to business too. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. exactly right. Yeah. And so um, are there things about your passions, DJing, whatever, that, that you actually apply into your work life as well? Well, I, hadn't, I don't know that I had, I had thought about it, you know, in the same context of what you're talking yeah. about with, um, with martial arts. You know, for me, the thing, the thing that I love about, about music and in particular when I'm actually, you know, DJing live, when you're doing it, you have to be 100% present in what you're doing. And, you know, one of my big challenges is I got a lot going on in my head every day, particularly around work. <laughs> yeah. You know, everywhere I'm going, I'm thinking about, I got to do this, I got to do that, I've got to think about this. Did I make the right decision about this? When I'm doing this, my head is, I am 100% present. My mind is 100% clear. And I actually find that after doing it, you know, the next day I've got room, you know, to think about and make decisions about other things. It's like, I need to clear my head yeah. in order to give me an opportunity to do that. You know, part of the, part of the, I think you that's know, a great point. I, it's, that's it's, it's, a you, you ton of the reason head. why. Yeah, you got you got I'm sure with martial arts, there's yeah. a lot of you know you're clearing your head. Absolutely, um, which is a great thing. You know, the the you know, being a DJ is not a great skill. I mean, you know, most people they <laughs> spend a little bit of time can be can, terrible. You can yeah. you can acquire the base skill of mixing music together, but you know the cool thing is you've got to curate music, you've got to pick music, and the cool thing is when you're doing it, watching how people respond. Yeah. And I actually think there is just thinking about, you know, your question about how do you apply it to work? You know, I think one of the things you've got to do as a leader, you've got to do in your meetings with people, you've got to do when you deal with clients or customers, is you've got to listen and watch how they respond and they react to mm -hmm. the discussion, the environment, you know, what's going on. And you've got to tailor what you're doing in some way to incorporate the way people respond to you, the way people respond to what you're saying, the way yeah. people respond to what you're doing. And when you're, when you're actually playing music, you're watching how people are responding and you're adjusting based on the feedback that oh, you get. And I think that's very, very yeah. important you know, in business too. You've got to listen to the feedback and you've got to adjust. Yeah. Uh, my bet is it's a ton of the reason why you've been as successful as you have been by just, you know, because our jobs are always trying to sort of define reality and inspire hope. 
Um, but a lot of that reality comes from listening to what people are actually telling us. It's an important, it's an important skill for all of us. And, you know, look, it's, it's interesting. I work in this, this wonderful organization, Goldman Sachs, that is filled with incredibly, incredibly smart, talented people. Yep. Um, you know, obviously along the way, you know, I've had a bunch of successes that's helped me advance, but I've also become a big believer that there's a lot of serendipity for guys like you and me around, you know, the progression of these careers. Sure. Because timing matters a lot, Absolutely. you know, and how all this stuff plays out. And I think it's very important as a leader, you don't lose sight of that. You know, yeah. we're stewards of these organizations, could be someone else. Yeah. Um, you know, there's no, there's no destiny in all this. It's, it's, it's a little bit of luck and a little bit of timing, mean, a lot of hard work. And a hard work. And a lot of Absolutely. hard work with a lot of people yeah. around you that are equally capable yeah. of getting it done. There's no substitute for the hard work. No part substitute of it, for the hard work. But you, you're absolutely right. Timing, just being, maybe taking advantage of the moments that you have. But absolutely. you never know when those moments are either. Yeah. I mean, so you and I both have um, sort of uh, our education in common. You went to Hamilton College. I went to Middlebury College in the same athletic conference. We used to beat you all the time. I don't uh, know that that's really no, fair I don't back know in the 80s. True. I don't know that's Might true either. Might have been true in the last 10 years, but not in the <laughs> 80s. <laughs> okay. So, you know, what did you study at Hamilton? What was your major? And do you think that had any doing on your career path going forward? So I, I, I was a political science major. Um, at Hamilton, um, and I also studied a lot of um, sort of a lot of history, American history in particular. You know, I, I I think that my education at Hamilton had an enormous impact mm -hmm. on my um, my career um, and my ability to kind of adapt and evolve. You know, Hamilton, even back uh, when I went to school in the early 1980s, did not have structured distribution requirements across mm. the curriculum the way lots of schools did. I don't, I don't recall, or maybe you remember what Middlebury did, but basically no. Hamilton had three requirements. You had to take writing as a freshman, mm -hmm. you had to take public speaking as a freshman, and you had to either run around the track or swim a bunch of laps in the pool right. to prove that you could actually <laughs> physically function. Right. Right. And those were the only requirements wow. at Hamilton College. But there was a, there was a focus that then translated from the writing course and the public speaking course in all of the classwork that communication was a huge emphasis of the education. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've become a big, big believer that something that separates leaders, but actually I think has a huge impact on the way people succeed in organizations. You've got to be able to communicate. Yeah. And, you know, communication is a skill that's just so important. And candidly, I don't think people work on it enough. Yeah. And, uh, and I really came out of Hamilton with an incredible base, you know, around that. Um, and I think it's really helped me. Yeah. And I, I've obviously worked at it over the years and thought about it a lot, but I'm a huge advocate for people really honing their communication skills and their critical thinking skills, you know, during their college education. And people come in in a very goal-oriented way. I notice it yeah. when my kids are in their 20s, and I notice it with all the young people that we interview you know, that come into our organization. They're so goal-oriented and so trying to say, what should I take, what should I do, as opposed yeah. to just kind of learning to communicate, learning to think critically on a range of topics, debating. Yeah. Um, you know, those things I think matter and ultimately provide a very solid foundation for people professionally in almost anything you choose to do. Yeah, couldn't agree more. You um, also mentioned, and this is different than a lot of people, that Shakespeare, actually influenced your move into finance. And I love Shakespeare as well. In fact, um, I just gave the uh, commencement speech at, uh, at Rutgers uh, this past weekend, and I quoted Shakespeare in it. And the quote I did was, there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so, which re to me is like such a powerful statement about the power of attitude and optimism in like how you um, think about life and how you think about work. What was it about Shakespeare and what kind of led you to that sort of thought between Shakespeare and finance? Well, it, it, would, be a little, it would be a little bit of a stretch that it led yeah. me to finance, but I just loved, I mean, one of the great experiences I had at Hamilton College um, was Hamilton College offered a course to seniors where you took two semesters of Shakespeare, one in the fall, one in the spring, and then Hamilton at the time was 414, so there was a January term yeah. in January yeah 
you went to London and you spent the wow. whole month How going great. to theater, you know, four or five nights a week, including going up to Stratford. Um, and it was just, when I think about kind of enriching experiences in my Hamilton College experience, um, this, you know, this Shakespeare, uh, you know, experience was a great experience. And so I loved it. Um, I was surprised at how much I tuned into it and really enjoyed it. And, you know, it would be, it would be a stretch to say that it, it, it connected me to finance. But yep. what I would say, when you go back to kind of communication and storytelling, you know, and thought process, it's yep. rich, it stimulates the mind. And, you know, my, my favorite Shakespeare quote is not as profound as yours, but <laughs> what it, is it? if music is the food of love, play on. Uh, yeah. And how so, uh, so it's, um, yeah. it's, it's just, it was a wonderful, enriching, when am I ever going to get a chance to spend a year, you know, in a class talking about Shakespeare, going to theater in London? I mean, you know. Were you a character in, the, in a play? Uh, I was, I was not, I, I was, I was not ever front stage. <laughs> I was only behind oh, stage. God. <laughs> um, not, not my thing. Yeah. Yeah. I was Lysander in a mid Oh, were century. you really? Yeah. Terrible Lysander, right. by the way, I might add. Um, so let's move um, a little bit to uh, your current role and even like how you've been a leader at Goldman uh, over the last number of years. I know that the talent that you attract, the culture uh, that you have at uh, Goldman are key to your success and they're key to really any company's success. But one of your biggest priorities has been diversity. And one of my favorite quotes around diversity um, is that diversity is a fact, but inclusion is a choice. Um, and you've made that a choice um, at, uh, at Goldman. Can you uh, talk a little bit about why that's so important to you and why it's become sort of a, uh, a foundational element of the culture of the firm? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, for all of us, I just think we're at a point in time where enough already, it's you know, time. we've got to get this yeah. right and we've got to move the needle. Um, you know, as a father of two daughters, you know, I have trouble, you know, looking and talking to my daughters about this yeah. and, and explaining why, you know, for so long we haven't made more, you know, progress on this front. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm passionate that it's right because it's right, but I'm also passionate because it's right for the business and our business is better if you harness the, if you harness the intellectual capacity of men and women broadly on an equal basis with different views, et cetera. Um, there's just more that we can get out of, you know, our business and our people and the work that we do with our clients. You know, I was at an event last night where Inge Tulin, the CEO of 3M, mm -hmm. uh, was honored by the Foreign Policy Association for work that he and 3M have done you know, broadly around corporate citizenship and corporate responsibility and sustainability. And he got talking for a moment about, um, about diversity and inclusion. And he said something that's very, very simple. Um, I hadn't heard it said exactly this way before, but it really resonated with me. Diversity is why someone comes to 3M. Inclusion is why they stay. Mm. And, you know, I think when you, when you put this all together, you know, I think, I think that's what you want in an organization. You want it to be a place that welcomes people, but if it's not inclusive and it's yeah. not real and it's then not fair, leave. then people yeah. leave. Yeah. And, you know, human capital is everything in our business. We have to have the most extraordinary workforce we possibly can to be as effective for our clients as we want to be. And if we don't have an environment that really embraces both diversity and inclusion, it's to our disadvantage. Yeah. And so it's just a business imperative yeah. besides that it's the right thing to do. Yeah. You also have been a champion of kind of a, a different kind of Wall Street, if you will. Wall Street has always been known for being incredibly hard driving, you know, people, you know, working 20 hours uh, a day. And it seems from what I've read and what I've seen is that you're just trying to create a different type of culture, maybe a little bit more of a balanced culture. I mean, I, I find that it's hard for me at least to really separate out, you know, uh, work-life balance. I kind of feel like life is just seamless. Is. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And, you know, I do work at home. I do personal stuff at work. I mean, it's just sort of like I just live life on that. But what kind of culture are you trying to um, promote at Goldman that might be slightly different from what people might imagine a Wall Street culture could be like? Sure. There, look, there are... There are there are lots of stereotypes and perceptions yeah. about what, you know, the culture is in any organization. 
some of them have a grain of truth in them, some of them don't, and this yeah. would be true, you know, with, with any organization. Look, there's no question, you know, as finance and Wall Street exploded in the, you know, in the 80s and 90s, you know, this culture of, you know, run into the wall, yeah. you know, definitely developed. And part of the reason it developed is the whole incentive system as Wall Street and finance was really exploding. The whole incentive system was really correlated to effort in, result out. In other words, it was, it was an incentive system that really rewarded people enormously with enormous upside for short-term output. Yeah. And it's not surprising if you go back and look at that, that the result of that was it created this culture where just more was better, harder was better, run faster, jump higher, mm. work harder. Now, as all that was going on, we lived in a world, candidly, that wasn't connected the way the world is connected today. And I mean, I talk about this and it's silly, yeah. but it's simple. When I, was in, when I was young and working in finance, my work kind of looked like this, up, down, right. up, down. I worked very, very hard, but then I took a break. I worked till midnight, but I left the office. And if I chose not to come in until 11 o'clock the next morning, no one could find me. No one knew, knew where I was. If they called my home phone, <laughs> right. they got the answering machine. Even if I was there, I didn't pick it up. But you were able to set boundaries and you know, regulate in some way. In the world we live in today, yep. people text, email, if they don't get a response in 30 minutes, you know, they send you another one, where are you? I need you, I want you, I want this now. You know, clients demand now, now, now. Yep. And you evolve into this kind of perpetual 24 seven client service oriented organization where young people that are starting out don't have the experience and the maturity to figure out how to balance all that. Yep. And they need, they need guardrails, they need parameters, they need expectations set. And you know, look, if you want your employees to thrive over a long period of time, then you've got to help them with that. And you've got to create an environment where they can thrive and run the marathon. Yep. It's like a marathon runner that's going to run a marathon in eight minute miles, you know, running the first mile in six minutes a mile. Yeah. You know they're going to have they're going to have a lot of trouble, and so we've had to we've had to adapt with that. Now, all that said, and you said it yourself, and I said it before, success in any endeavor comes with hard work. Yeah, there is no substitute for hard nope. work. There is no substitute for commitment. There's no shortcuts, you know, to long term success and productivity. But you have to create an environment that embraces and accepts that people have multifaceted lives and you can work very, very hard, yeah. but you can also play hard and people yeah. need room to build their lives, build their families, you know, experience everything and also be committed to your organization. And if you don't create that environment, you're not gonna be an attractive, desirable place for people to work. Yeah. I mean, I think that's where your DJing and other things actually are sort of role model examples of that, that it's not just one facet. I mean, because people might think all you are is hard, hard work all the time, and you do work all the time, but you have life. Your family's important to you, as you mentioned. Uh, you've got a ton of things outside, and I, I think that actually, if we live that way, I think it, it's helpful for others uh, to take a look at that. I mean, I, I, and, and I, you know, I, I absolutely agree that it's, it's, it's we living that way, but the thing that I've learned over the last few years that's different is there's a real benefit to sharing a little bit of it you know, we've, I, I had always kept my private life very private, yeah. but I'm understanding both in the position I'm in and, and for other reasons, sharing a little bit more of it is actually, is healthy. Yeah. Healthy for me, healthy for people who work with yeah. me. Yeah. Not always easy to Not do. Not always easy to do, but, yeah. but if you can find the right balance, help. Yeah. So maybe playing off of that remark a little bit, you know, um, Part of this, like, never stand still uh, motto is this is sort of another thing that my I trainer. I thought that was about me, never yeah. stand still. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it is about us, actually, all the time. But my trainer always says, like, and he teaches me this lesson every morning that if I stand still, he's going to hit me. Um, and um, so it's like a, a big sort of uh, boxing and, and Krav Maga thing that you just never stand it and just go straight at it because he's going to hit you. Yeah. So. As you um, maybe think about our audience out there and they think about, you know, who you are now and where you are, and we talked about it's very hard to, to just have a career that just goes straight and up to the right. Are there times where you've been hit hard and, you know, and have, you know, fallen and then you've gotten back up, you know, and... and Maybe what were some of those and what were some of the lessons that you learned from it? Because there, 
to me at least, those have been the most important leadership lessons for me. Look, it's, it's you know, all of us, you know, as you say, you go down this road and you have up and downs and there are, you know, there are, I, I've had plenty of hard hits, you yeah. know, especially personally, yeah. that, um, you know, that certainly have kind of rocked me, you know, in my, in my shoes. And professionally, you know, two, ups and downs, big mistakes. You know, the thing that I would say that I have perspective on now that I might not have when I was younger, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the professional stuff, you know, it's just, it's just bumps in the road. You're gonna make a lot of mistakes, you're gonna do a lot of things wrong, you're gonna get knocked back, it's not a straight line. You've just gotta be resilient yeah. and you've gotta be open to learning. And, you know, you've gotta, you have to be willing to say, wow, I really screwed that up. What can I learn from this? Not be defensive, you know, not take it too personally. You've gotta be very thick skinned yeah. as you know, you go through all this. Um, but I've come to appreciate that if I've got my personal life in order, I've got my family in order, my friends in order, you know, all the things that, that really matter, I can take a lot of bumps and bruises at work. Yeah. Uh, a lot of bumps and bruises at work. But the things, you know, the things that have affected me, you know, more, you know, are, are personal things. And what you have to do is, you know, you got to wake up every day and do the best you can. You've also got to recognize, I mean, look, my, you know, unfortunately, and this, this would certainly be, you know, something that rocked me pretty hard. You know, both my parents died pretty young. My, yeah. my, father, my father passed away at 77 and my mom at 71. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, as someone in his mid fifties, you know, when you look at that, you know, keep it all in perspective. <laughs> you know, every day, is, every day is precious. And, yeah. you know, we all make the choices as to how we spend our time and what we do. Um, you know, touch wood, we've got long, yeah. healthy lives I'll ahead. Do, but touch uh, wood on but that. that's, um, but, you know, that, that gives you some perspective on what really matters. Yeah. It's so unfortunate uh, for a lot of us. I, you know, my sister died when I was younger and that rocked my world as well. It's so unfortunate that those like horrible things, you know, that you never wish on anybody are the things that make you appreciate every day yes. uh, so much. But I, I do think... Uh, it's important for us not to, you know, go through the day and, you know, you have this incredibly busy calendar, you look at it and you're like, oh my gosh, one meeting after another, but that you find some joy in every day. Absolutely. It's really important. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, David, I want to thank you oh, so much um, for your time and uh, um, congratulations on all of your success. Well, thank you. Yeah. Congrats to you on all the good things at PayPal. Yeah, Always great so to much. be with you. Great Thanks to be very with much. You too. You Thank bet. you. Thank you.